Okay. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Chat and Mill Movie Hour. We are going to unpack and review The Fountain, which is one of my top five favorite movies of all time by Darren Aronofsky. And I had suggested it to Chad, and I believe, Chad, this was your first time watching it, yes? Yes. Okay. So we're going to give a little bit of context on the movie. Um, we're going to unpack it at the end of this video. If you can make it all the way through with us, we invite you to stay tuned because we're going to tease our big project that we're working on together, which we're so, so fucking excited about. So stay tuned, and thank you to Marissa for suggesting it. Um, but yes. yeah, so uh, Chad, I suggested The Fountain. You had already seen, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you've seen like Pi and Pie. The William for a Dream, his two previous films. Yes, and there was a, I looked him up, there was a few others I had seen as well. Black Swan, um, <laughs> and well, what, are, what are the other films? So, uh, Pi and Requiem were before The Fountain, and then Black Swan came out after, and then Noah, which I will withhold my comments on, and then <laughs> most recently Mother, which you also Mother. loved. That's searching for a mother. Yep, which I loved. So, so I will, if um, I may, just give a little bit of context on the film. So, the movie came out in 2006. It um, was directed and written by Darren Aronofsky. Uh, the cinematography was done by a gentleman by the name of Matthew Libatique, and their uh, art director, um, I think I may have misplaced the art director, but one of my favorite things about- How dare you. Say again? How dare you. I know, I know. It's very hot and I'm losing my mind. Um, I'll find him, but the art direction is very important because we're gonna circle back to like that. Um, but anyways, the score is one of my favorite parts of the movie. The score to this movie is probably one of also my favorite scores in all of cinematic history. I am moved to like my DNA when I listen to the score of The Fountain. The sound designer is Stephen Barden. Um, and the, uh, where is it? Hang on, music department, pause. So Kronos with a K, Kronos Quartet is the symphony that, that plays the score. Um, the music director is uh, Jeff Foster and Mogwai, the band actually also does a lot of the art. So in honor of Mogwai, I wore my gizmo and I have my gizmo. But yes, so that's a little bit about, you know, who are the showrunners. It stars Hugh Jackman and Rachel Weisz. Before I go off on a full tangent, I just want to say that even when this movie came out in 2006, I was very excited for it to come out because I was a big fan of his work already. But there was a lot of like kind of, not mythology, but like there was a lot of drama and lore about this movie getting made. And apparently it was the most expensive movie he's ever made. And it took him close to 10 years to get it into production. Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett were originally cast, but due to scheduling, they eventually dropped out. And he saw Hugh Jackman in a play and got Hugh Jackman on board. And Hugh Jackman was like, oh, you need to peep Rachel Weisz. And that's how they got Rachel Weisz. So that's my, like, just laying the foundation of this uh, Chad, you just watched it. Why don't you tell us your initial thoughts, feelings, and concerns? I'm going to open my window. Okay, so I, I did a little bit of, uh, a little bit of research on it, as much as you. Um, my first time seeing it, I really liked it a lot. The score, it clearly, uh, stuck with me as well. So I love to hear you say that. Um, wow, what an image, though. I didn't know that uh, Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett were the original for it. I can't imagine that with the film that I saw. Do you know what I mean? Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, I like those actors, all right, but not for this. Um, at least not as we have it now, you know? It's weird to imagine it. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Wow. Bye. Sorry. I have to keep my window open or I'll die, but continue. That's okay, but I loved it. And um, it starts off as one thing and you're kind of moving through it and it's kind of dramatic in a way. Um, and you're not sure how connected, there's three storylines, right? And you're not sure like how connected they are. My favorite of the three storylines was the more science fiction-y one about the astronaut in the eco spaceship. Um, and he, the whole ending of the film is my favorite part of the film too. So I think we'll talk more about that when we get to it. But um, I just thought it was really interesting, really cool. Not your typical movie. And I would say it's in a top three of his films, probably. I haven't seen that many of his films, but I definitely know that Pi is my favorite still. And um, I would put this one higher than Black Swan or uh, Requiem even. I wasn't like the hugest. I know you're going to like kill me for saying that, probably. But, um, you know, this and Mother are my two favorite films, probably, and Pi. So those are my three. Mother, Pi, and this film. Um, it's interesting because I can't get a sense, even from those three films, there's not like a, um, like a fingerprint from him, like there are some other directors that are as beloved as he is. Now I wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. But anyway, that's just my initial impression. I loved it. Like, I love the way it looks. It's like a world that you live in. It has a very specific look. And um, I, I thought both actors did a really good job. Um, there were parts of it that were maybe a little melodramatic for my taste, kind of. But I get why, why it's like that for the story and for this film. Anyway, so um, what do you think? So I like your ranking. So I'm not going to kill you. I actually am, am very much in agreement with you. So I think Pot is kind of like set a precedent for like what filmmaking can be. And in terms of his catalog, I think I, and also because it's the first, right? Like it's really always hard to like top your first effort as an artist or whatever, but yeah. I would put, this is like so hard because like I would definitely put Fountain above Black Swan because Black Swan was the most mainstream of his films I think to date. Um, but I think that, you know, Requiem is, is so beautiful and so well acted so well done but i think for me again i'm biased because the fountain is in my top fave favorite movies period of all time yeah, wow. every time i watch it i glean something entirely like just something new that i didn't notice before or i have a feeling that i've never had before um but in terms of just darren aronofsky's catalog i think you're you're hierarchy is on point. I think it's, you know, pie is, is, is it, right? Um, but I would put fountain either tied with pie or on top, and then I maybe do Requiem, and then I do Mother, and then I do Black Swan, and he made a movie apparently called Noah, but I don't even want to discuss it. Okay, <laughs> we, we won't discuss it, but don't, I did read about you know, how controversial it was. And uh, we just don't have to d discuss it because I haven't seen it either, so. But I think, um, you know, jokes aside, it, it should be discussed because there was an article I was reading in doing research for this movie hour about the fountain where Aronofsky was interviewed as, uh, and, and said in said interview that uh, the fountain and Noah in some ways are like, they go hand in hand. Um, so I need to unpack that further, but that's like for another moment. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about 
before we kind of get into like the heady philosophical like moments in the plot is the use of practical effects in this film because you're a big horror fan you're a big horror aficionado and you're a big just cinephile and especially when it comes to special effects this movie i think just like many movies that use practical effects in the face of CGI or access to CGI do so well with their niche audiences because we see through CGI and CGI just doesn't give you the emotional um, feedback that you get right. when you practical. Like we just reviewed um, uh, Obayashi's house, which is nothing but practical effects, you know, right. to camp. But even when the movie came out in 2006, and I'll try and keep this rant brief, um, the cinematography, like all of those effects that you see in the fountain where he's floating, as you called him, the astronaut on the eco ship. Is that what you said? Yep. Okay. So I love that, by the way. Um, but when you see Tom in the, as astronaut in the eco ship, like flying through space towards Shibulba, none of that is CGI. It's literally um, microcosmic photography. So they basically did micro, uh, I, I hope I'm using the right terminology here, but it, it's not macrocosmic cosmic photography. They, they basically like filmed chemical reactions and with a microcosmic like whatever lens right captures that's, that detail that's what they did in that's i i believe that's what they did in 2001 a space odyssey okay. at the very end basically yeah so you're not seeing what you're seeing is not like footage of like the I microscope. you're actually seeing that's chemical that's reactions under a microscope that's amazing yeah, that's how they got all those weird explosions for the universe at the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's like different things mixed in oil, having reactions, and being filmed up close. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a testament to his vision as a filmmaker and to the cinematographer's te testament to the cinematographer's vision, but to he made it a point that he did not want CGI in the fountain. And even those shots where Hugh Jackman is like interacting with the tree of life and you see the little hair stand on end or yeah. he's looking Rachel Weiss's skin and you see her hair. It's, it's literal static electricity that they were filming. That's not CGI. It's oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to like bring that up in case um, you had any thoughts cool. on that or, or, you know, whatever but the use of practical effects in this film like or in any film but specifically in this one like they cause you the audience to emote and to like empathize and to like react in a way that like cgi just would have ruined for me personally mm. yeah that's a really good point a lot of films that are well, we grew up watching Practical, so that there's that. Yeah. But CGI, I think to anyone would agree, has a very specific like look and feel, and it's getting more realistic, right? But it's not the same as actual photography, even today, I think. So it has a feel, and it's almost like you can use it as a tool, as a paintbrush, as an artist, like any other tool, but you have to just really know your tool and know that if you're going to use CGI, it's going to be like, you almost have to commit to a full-on CGI film, or you, or you do what they did in Netflix, The Dark Crystal, for example, where you do have the main action practical, and you just enhance it around the edges with CGI, which is how I feel like it always should be done. Like, there's little touches that CGI is great for, but when CGI is star of the film it always bothers me agreed agreed and we're so saturated with it these days that um when you see something that doesn't utilize it it's very refreshing yeah. I know this came out in 2006 this movie is 13 almost 14 years old and it was not 
well, like it was not a box office success. It was very critically acclaimed, but it's become a cult classic as much as many of its films have become. But yeah. he was even saying in an interview that I was reading that there are so many layers and ways to look at the three um, timelines, if you will, that he is interested in recutting the film in a new way. Um, and so just to give the audience a little bit of context here, you have two main characters, Tommy played by Hugh Jackman and Izzy played by Rachel Weisz. Now, Rachel Weisz, I think if you've seen anything Rachel Weisz has been in, you understand that she's an incredible actress. If you've seen anything that Hugh Jackman's been in, I think you can agree that he's an incredible, he, he's a renaissance man as far as I'm con concerned. Like, somebody that can play like Wolverine and also be like a song and dance man, like, yes, yeah. all of that. Like, and they were both already a list when this movie came out, but to think that somebody as AAA plus list as like Brad and Kate could have played them and then seeing what Hugh Jackman like everything Rachel Weisz does in this movie is amazing, but it's like, for me, it's like given, like she's gonna nail it. When I see Hugh Jackman in this movie with the material that he's given and the way he just fucking runs with it and just emotes and nails it, like I am just so moved by, by their performances. And I think the casting is so delicious because it gives you like these non-obvious actors with this non-obvious material. And it just, it, it's beautiful. I don't know, what, what do you think about like the casting? Yeah, and I kept, I agree, but I kept thinking, um, you know, these are actors that can definitely choose what they want to do. And they, this is something they chose, not because it was gonna make a lot of money, but because they actually believed in the project, I think, which is kind of cool. Um, but when I was looking into the film, um, Rachel, her first first ever film was this um, B horror called Death Machine. And I don't know if you've ever seen Death Machine, but when I was a kid, it was it was like a VHS rental or DVD rental or whatever. Probably VHS because I was super young at the time. But um, I just remember seeing the cover of it and it had this like metallic claw hand coming out of like liquid, like chrome on the cover, um, Death Machine. So I was like, she was in that. And it was just like a cool moment for me to realize that that's how she started her career. Probably something she's not proud of, but I think it's pretty badass. Um, but uh, it's just, yeah, I think, that they chose to do this film because they believed in the project based on the script. Yeah, agreed. And I I just looked up Death Machine. I've not seen it. It's going on the to-do list. We may have to do a movie review. But it, it reminds me of like Renee Zellweger having been in like, and Matthew McConaughey having been in like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. for like 23 yeah. or some shit, whatever it was. Sorry, yeah. like my wisps aren't doing, there we go. At least they're like, there we go. But like, yeah, like to see, to know that like your favorite people, like your A-listers that you love and respect come from like the D-list is very yeah. refreshing. Especially the horror D-list. So yeah, we'll be watching that. But um, I'm just gonna do like a quick tight overview of the plot. And then if, if you're okay, like we can unpack it and go from there. Let's um, do it. So the premise of this movie, or as it was sold, I guess, to mainstream audiences, you know, with the trailer and the marketing, was that you have a love story between Hugh Jackman's character Tommy and Rachel Weisz's character Izzy, who is dying. We know not of what, but, you know, she's got a terminal illness. Uh, he's a scientist slash doctor. He's trying to find the cure for her. Um, he's very much in denial of her dying. She is very much accepting of the fact that she's dying. And what you see is, at first glance, three timelines. So you see the present, which is what I just described. And in this present, Izzy is writing a story that takes place in the 1500s about a conquistador, also played by Hugh Jackman, and his character's name is Tomas or Thomas, whatever, because he's playing a Spaniard. 
and she plays uh, the Queen of Spain in the narrative that she's writing. And, and she's she beautiful in that part. Honestly, like when the lighting on her, when she's in that like candlelit room and she's like, go and like save Spain for me. Like I can't even deal with it. Yes. yes. If I had makeup and lighting from the fount, I, 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 I'm switching from wine to sake out of the bottle now. Pretty spectacular. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, but she's basically the present her as she's dying is writing this novel of this conquistador who has been sent by the Queen of Spain to the Mayan civilization to bring back the Fountain of Youth, which they believe that they have located. And in doing so, will release Spain from bondage from the um, Inquisitor, from you know the Grand, in the Catholic Grand Inquisition. You know, metaphor, metaphor, metaphor. And then you have this other storyline where, and they're all kind of spliced, you're flashing between the three, of you know a bald Hugh Jackman, in as Chad would describe it, um, an astronaut in eco spaceship is that what you said an eco yes. okay so you have bald hugh jackman seemingly in a future timeline with a dying tree of life in this orb that's flying through space and time and in within that timeline you're seeing like flashes back or flashes forward there, there's like this overlap of the narrative the the premise of the movie is the denial versus the acceptance of death. And it's a beautiful, just narrative on how we fight against death. And it, the movie to me offers up, the narrative offers up an alternative, which is that death is in fact an act of creation and is in fact the road to awe. And you're seeing this woman and I was reminded of Lars von Trier in Melancholia and Kirsten Dunst's performance where you see somebody who is just so fully accepting of an apocalyptic event, of the end of days, of the end of her life. And I saw that in Rachel Weisz. Like, you're seeing somebody that's just like, she even says at some point in the movie, like, when she stops being able to feel hot and cold because of her illness, she says to Hugh Jackman, her lover, who is also her doctor, something inside of me has changed. She's no longer afraid. So you have her fully accepting what's happening and trying to spend what time is left with her lover and he's just in denial and spending every moment trying to fix the situation, trying to find the cure to death. In the movie, he says, death is a disease. Like any other, I will find a cure. And that was actually a scene that Darren Aronofsky was gonna cut but ended up keeping in the film. So anyways, that's kind of just like my tirade on the overall plot. Uh, Chad, do you want to take the reins here or I'll keep going? Um, no, no, I've thought of things to say along the way, but... <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, first of all, um, so I don't know if this is jumping too far ahead into the film. Actually, not really, because he does it at multiple points. But at multiple points throughout the film, when he's in the ecosphere, um, spaceship flying through space, he is, he's like feigning himself like a, a Buddhist monk, like very, very, um, just very, like on very little with like a lot of meditation. And part of it is he takes a little piece of bark green like the tree of life, and eats it. And every, when he does that, it's such a satisfying act in the film. I don't know why, but it's like really satisfying to watch it. That's just something I thought of, but. You see, you don't know why it's satisfying to watch um, in film, but like, personally, like what did it in, like, in, like elicit in you that made it satisfying to watch him eat from the tree of life? Or was it not a personal moment and just a cinematic satisfaction? I, it might have just been a cin cinematic thing, but um, 
I just, I just think it was like a, just a really cool moment. And then the whole end, we have to, the whole end of it, we have to like really get into because we will. I, didn't, I didn't see a lot come that, that happened at the end. And, but to me, it was some of the most interesting stuff in the film. Um, you know, of course, his romance with um, the Rachel's character, um, his wife in the film is very, like touching and moving, but I kind of gravitated more to some of the more like um, metaphysical, like bigger, crazier sequences and scenes. Um, it's a real interesting, bizarre mix of a film because you have like the kind of like period action when he's the um, conquistador, and then you have a more of like a health drama between him and his wife which is kind of a love story but overarching all of this it's really about like life and death and the the circle of life and then you have like this futuristic stuff with him um you know a bald him who like i was saying lives like very minimally very cleanly and mostly on meditation and can fly and stuff and oh my god that some of those scenes are so um, I don't know if you want to talk about the end of the film yet, or you probably, we're not there yet, but, uh, there's, yeah. so, there's so much, there's so much, like, and, and I just want to say, like, I saw this movie in the theater when it came out in 20, 2006, which, to me, to think that I saw this movie 13 years ago, like, is too much for me to process, and is very in keeping with the theme of this movie, which is, like, time is a motherfucker and a trip, but, like, yeah. We will get to the ending because the last 10 minutes of this film is, is, is just, I think, some of the most important 10 minutes of art that I've ever experienced. But I, I want to beg a question of you and of the audience because I've probably seen this movie about two dozen, 30 times, like-ish. Like I said, every time I watch it, I get something new. I pick up on something new. And in preparation for this, I, I read some stuff, um, which is now quite old. But there was an article on Collider, and I'll link it in the description. But the article suggests that the there are not three timelines. So there is no present. There is no the 1500s. There is no future. What we see as, again, as you would describe as like kind of monk Hugh Jackman, minimalistically surviving off meditation and prana and, and the tree of life in space and the eco spaceship is in fact not a third timeline, but is a allegory for what he's experiencing psychologically as he's dealing with her death and like, his reconciliation with accepting or denying death in his life and his own death, not just hers, right? Not just the love of his life. So she's written this narrative. So we flash back or we just flash to this narrative that's taking place in the 1500s. And, and the film opens with this conquistador played by Hugh Jackman, Thomas or Tomas, basically raping and pillaging this Mayan temple only to find this Mayan um, guardian or whatever, high priest, whatever, shaman. And he kills Hugh Jackman's, the conquistador character, right? And then you flash back into the present narrative. But, at but the is, is all that the book that she's writing? Yeah, so she writes 11 chapters or 12 chapters and then she lets him write the last, whatever amount of chapters it is. Let's just say it's 11 chapters. Like she's written the book and then she keeps telling him to finish it. Even in the future, even in the past, you keep hearing her voice echo, like finish it, finish it. Right. And he's like, I don't know how to finish. And she's like, you will soon. And he's like in denial. He's like, stop, like stop talking about death. Stop talking about loss. I'm not going to lose you. I'm going to save you. But in the beginning of the movie, the shaman, when the conquistador comes to the temple or whatever, 
seeking the tree of life or the fountain of youth kills Hugh Jackman, the conquistador. But in the end, once the astronaut in the ecosphere version of Hugh Jackman accepts that he's dying, and he even says to the manifestation of Rachel Weisz, like, I'm ready, I'm gonna die. And he even says it with a smile on his face. Like, he's like, I'm gonna die. Like, he's like, finally accepting. He's like, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And she's like, yeah, bro, you're gonna die. And we'll be together forever. And then when he transforms because he's accepting death, the narrative changes. And when you see that same conquistador uh, confront that Mayan shaman, the Mayan, instead of killing the conquistador, slits his own throat because he realizes he's seeing first father. He's seeing the person that has accepted death as an act of creation and sacrifices himself such that first father can give birth to the cosmos. And then you see Hugh Jackman as this conquistador who doesn't know what's going on. He's still in his own reality go out to the tree of life which is beautifully shot and backlit and that's a whole nother conversation but you yeah. see him go up to the tree of life which is in the film the fountain of youth what's supposed to give immortality what right. real life present hugh jackman is seeking like he's seeking the cure to keep his wife alive right and he goes up to the tree of life and he stabs the tree of life and this and and, and this is what i love about the movie in terms of art direction sorry 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 go ahead no no I ju i'm just adding something inappropriate over here no go ahead. no i'm gonna get real inappropriate real quick because when he this is what i love about that scene in the tree of life is because when he stabs it when i was seeing it in the film i was expecting like sap to come out but it's like calm it's like mother's milk it's like semen yeah. it's like yeah. glue it's just really that whole scene to me is extremely pornographic in that it's like European male, white male, or just take all of the politics out of it, just like human nature, like greed, like I want to live, I want to live. And he's just like, he's guzzling it, he's guzzling it. <laughs> and even yeah. when he like puts it, the, the milk or the sap on his wound and it heals, but then but then like he becomes first father like izzy was describing to him earlier in the movie when she was recanting or re recounting maya mythology to him and saying like shabalba like first father like became the earth he became the bloom he he became the stars and that's what happens to hugh jackman but he's still in denial. Like, he, he literally, like, flowers are blossoming out of his wound, and he's ripping them out because he's in denial and he doesn't want to die. And it's, it's scary, so, that almost, yeah. It's, it's pornographic, and it's gross, and it's beautiful, and it's just, like, I relate so much to Hugh Jackman's character in the movie because I'm really scared of death, not dying, but of death. And I'm very attached to like my reality. And so right. to to see that like portrayed on screen in such like graphic way, just mm -hmm. every time I watch it, I'm, I, I give it up to God. I'm just like, no. That's such an interesting take. So I read, um, yeah, just like, okay, so. Your turn. <laughs> that scene, so fascinating. It was a scene that was like, Took it from this is a good movie to, or a great movie or whatever to this is like something special and like super memorable you know what I mean and um yeah so at first he puts the sap on his wound and it heals it and you're like oh this is healing it's so like it's such like a beautiful thing because he's healed but then like you don't expect for um, all this growth of like plant matter to come out of it, like flowers and leaves and like lots of leaves starting to grow out of it. And he's like ripping it out. And then um, it's growing out from all over him and coming out of his mouth. And that's when it's almost like scary, but it's still kind of beautiful and it's so weird. But um, the director I was reading has said that this is his most like personal film 
in terms of spirituality and that it's his kind of statement on his own spirituality, which is kind of difficult for me because I'm not spiritual, really. But um, so I have a little bit of a disconnect with it there because I'm atheist. So there's a little bit of like a disconnect for me personally that maybe someone wouldn't feel if they were part of the same spiritual persuasion that maybe he is, which I have a feeling that he isn't 100% open with, but um, channels kind of through his art. So, but either way, very cool, very interesting. And then when the Christic bald Hugh Jackman, like, gets, gets um, super close to the star or sun or whatever he's moving toward, and he floats up out of his bubble and then um, fully gets, like, shot with light and becomes, like you said, the father now. Um, that is, like, the most, that, that along with the plant matter coming out of the, of the conquistador version of Jackman are like the most interesting things and the whole ending of it is just fascinating but um yeah I think definitely he was talking about his own spirituality and about life and death and it's just odd for someone that maybe doesn't see so much happening after you die um to see a film that places so much meaning on death and the circle of life like continuing like your energy or spirit continuing like reincarnation but even as an atheist or even as somebody that believes believe it maybe isn't the right word here but like as an atheist who might um and there, there's different ways of being an atheist too, right? Like, there are sure. various, like ways of interpreting like what happens when you die, even as an atheist. But the idea that like maybe you just go, you go to ground, right? And like that's it, like lights out, there is nothing, whatever. I think the movie even still speaks to that because the, the idea that like, you know, you have this kind of subtext of seeds, and there's even a moment in the movie where it's kind of in the last, th the third act, or even in the last 10 minutes, where, you know, woke Hugh Jackman, monk Hugh Jackman in the eco spaceship is accepting death and realizing that he cannot save, or he was not able to save the love of his life, and that he too has to die, everything has to die. In that acceptance, he, the narrative changes, just like it does with the conquistador meeting the Mayan gentleman. The, the narrative changes because earlier in the movie, there's a scene where in the present, he's in his lab and he's trying to like figure out how to like find a cure for whatever the disease is on the monkey that he's experimenting on. And Izzy comes in and she's like, oh, it's the first snow, just like come and spend time with me. And he's like, I can't bitch, like I'm trying to save your life. And, and you know, they're just on different pages. But when the narrative changes at the, in the third act, when he starts to reconcile that he has to die, everything has to die, and he accepts it, that story changes, and you flash back, but the narrative changes, and he does go outside with her into the first snow. And yeah. he hands her, or she, excuse me, she hands him like a seed pod, and you see him at the end of the film in the last 30 seconds plant that seed, at her grave such that she can become like the Mayans and first father and grow and, and fly away and, and death as an act of creation. But I say all of that to say like even looking at this film from an atheist perspective, it still rings true, I would imagine, because just that, that circle of like your body goes into the earth, right? Nothing happens after that. You're dead. You're fertilizer. But in being fertilizer, like, you're still giving birth to something new. Right. Well, even as, even as an atheist, it's almost like not I believe nothing happens. It's almost like I don't know in a lot of ways, too. Like, you're in some ways more open-minded than, say, a, a Catholic who, who is like, this is how it is, 100%. I know it's this way and I shun every other concept of God, right? 
Yeah. Um, whereas when you're an atheist, you're like, I don't think there's a God, but you know, we don't know there's not enough evidence. A lot of, a lot of, that's how I see it kind of, but I'm still very open-minded and it's still like really interesting to like see his unique take on spirituality because I think that this is like his unique special spirituality um, expressed through art. You know what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think they're, I mean, the nuance to this film, like again, like I've seen this movie over two dozen times. Every time I watch it, something new comes forth. And I think that's a testament to him as a filmmaker, but also to just the, the narrative of the human experience, right? Like what she was yeah. able to capture, which is that like, we don't know, like, are we atheist? Are we agnostic? Are we devout? And like, you know, you could argue that Hugh Jackman's character is, although he's a man of science, not to go off on like a whole lost allegory or metaphor here, but like, you know, he's a, he's devout though. Like science is his religion. He's so right. beholden to science and finding a cure to death and seeing death as a disease that can be overcome that mm. he did not spend any quality time with the love of his life when she needed it most because he was so beholden to science. Science was his religion. Atheism might have been his religion. I don't know, but like just that idea that like, I can fix it, I can be God, I can control things. When all she was trying to tell him from Jump Street was like, bruh, you can't, and I'm dying, and so are you, and just get on board because it's more fun if you do. And like to talk about, but like, do you have anything else that you want to talk about with the movie, um, the ending, the third act? And we'll just like pick up like I didn't go to the bathroom. No, I just yeah. So anyway, I just I just think that um, beyond any specific spirituality, this film is almost like its own spirituality. And like I said, it's a very specific expression of spirituality from the director through his art. And I don't, I think it almost depends on A, how open you are, and B, what you've already committed to believing or not believing, to how much you could take, get from the film in terms of satisfaction and, and in terms of an experience. But I think, um, you know, if you just try, try to experience it, how it's portrayed and you're open minded, it's an incredible film and it could just like blow your mind. So. I wanted to say thank you for sharing it with me because I do think it's a special film and I, I do love the director, so it was just really cool. Um, I always look forward to his films, but yeah. And I want to see this film again to, you know, I want to ruminate on it and see it again. And I want to see Mother again, for sure, so. Yeah, and I, I want to see Mother again. I want to see Noah again, even though I'm very resistant. But I've only seen Noah twice, and both times I was just like, I felt like it was his like moment of having, of like being beholden to like the studio and the box office because it just, I was so excited to see like Darren Aronofsky's take on like <laughs> the book of Genesis, right? Because he, yeah. he, he begins with that, with the fountain. Like the opening credits are a quote from the book of Genesis and how Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the fruit of knowledge. Take that again. Ate fruit from the tree of knowledge and were banished and, and God protected the garden and the tree with a, a flaming sword. And that's like a metaphor throughout the film. And when I heard like Darren Aronofsky was gonna like do a narrative about Noah as somebody that grew up Judeo-Christian and went to private Catholic school and is a philosophy major. I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then I saw the movie and it was like, no, 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 no. Right. I've, I've, this director seems to, again. yeah, this director keeps making films that you have to watch multiple times. Um, but that film stands apart from all his other work, according to everything I've read um as just that level of controversial even among his fans 
So, um, Jonathan's looking around the corner. What do you want? Edit that up. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so should I intro um, what I'm going to do next? Yes, but can I say like two more things about the fountain and close it out? Yes. Okay. So one of the things, like not to go down a Judeo-Christian rabbit hole, but like the, the main character, Hugh Jackman, is like in the, in the present, his name is Tommy. In the past, his name is Tomas. And in the future, they never actually call him by a name because he's by himself. But in the credits, he's just named as Tom. And there is like a Judeo-Christian like rabbit hole you can go down about the Apostle Tom and how Thomas was like the doubting apostle. Like he was the one that was like, Jesus ain't the son of God. Like I will see it when I believe it. And then when he saw it, he believed it and became the most devout. So there's like a level there of like subtext, uh, right. Bible wise. And then also the Hugh Jackman's last name, uh, Thomas's last name in the movie is Creo, C-R-E-O, which in Spanish, I believe means, oh God, did I lose it already? I'll, I'll circle back to that. But it means something that, um, Jonathan, what does Creo mean in Spanish? What? Creo. What does Creo mean? Creo? Yes. C-R-E-O. Oh, believe. I think. I believe. Think, believe, I think. Yeah, believe. So you have that layer too. So like nothing is an accident with Aronofsky, right? But the last thing I wanted to talk about with the fountain, which was something that I just really paid attention to this last time I watched, which was the rain. So like yes. the entire time that you're watching Hugh Jackman's character in the present like he has a wedding they're married he loses his wedding ring down the sink at the lab where he's trying to cure his wife's disease and then you see him like see a gentleman like dying in his hospital or or the hospital that his wife's dying in and you, they like focus on the ring and then he looks down at his hand and he's got no ring and then they flash to like the future tom where he's like got been tattooing all of the rings of his years on his arm and also tattooing a ring around his finger. Like the ring of a tree. Yes. And then, you know, she gave him in the present, Rachel Weiss's character, Izzy, gave him a fountain pen and ink to finish her story. And instead of finishing the story at first, anyways, he takes that pen and ink and he tattoos a ring around his finger because he's still in such denial. So there's just like like the seed, the ring, the tree of life. Like there's just like so much to like. There's so many layers to this delicious fucking onion. <laughs> there's that, so much to appreciate. Yeah. yeah, and like Mayan mythology and this like how they introduce the notion of Shabalba, which is real in Mayan mythology. Like it is the name of the like the ninth realm of the Mayan underworld where like death and creation are like kind of intermingled. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, there, there's just so much, there's just so much. That's really great art is when someone takes the time layering that richly, right? It just enhances the experience for you to uh, experience it over and over again. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved it. I can't wait to watch it again and then maybe discuss it with you again, but why don't you tell our, you know, millions and millions of viewers what's coming down the pike? So I am so excited for this that I cannot stand it, but we are gonna do um, Iron Alien Predator Universe. So it started off, I mean, Alien, my universe of it's my forte, really. I don't want to say I'm an expert, but I'm kind of an expert on Alien. But um, if, if I'm an expert on anything. But we're going to do the whole AVP universe. So starting with Predator, Predator 2, uh, and then jumping to Alien vs. Predator 1 and 2, 
and then Prometheus, Alien Covenant, Alien, Alien, Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection. So we're going to do all those films in that order. Um, we're both massive fans of this franchise, so I think that this is going to be like an awesome ride. We're both like well-versed in this universe, so I think it's something we can both talk like very freely. And um, it's exciting too, because as much as I've researched like this, especially the aliens side of this universe, um, it's, it's interesting to see Alien as its own thing, Predator as its own thing, but um, to, to do it all, uh, it's gonna be so much fun for you. I'm like really looking forward to this right now. And I think doing the research along the way, we're both gonna learn a lot that we didn't already know even, and especially in how the films kind of relate and how the story was told throughout the films, which were all made in different decades, and the consistencies and the inconsistencies. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, well, don't sell yourself short because you are the effing expert when it comes to alien mythology. And I'm, yeah, no, again, don't sell yourself short. Like, we are here. Uh, the audience needs to, like, take with just like heed that you are blessed that Chad Civic is here to deliver unto you the sermon on the mount as it were of alien mythology and just oh I can't, I can't. The, the, the film for alien or the um the video we make for alien might have to be like a two-hour film I don't know because <laughs> discussion because that film is obviously the pinnacle of that entire universe and it's one of the few masterpieces within that series of films so it's, it's also it's, one of the few masterpieces in all of like 20th century film period end of story but great point you're going I, but yeah but you are going to be like such an amazing steward of like just all of it and so yeah, too kind. Yes, you're, you're you're guru when it comes to this. So you're going to take the wheel, but if you could invite the audience to walk with us chronologically, like what should the audience watch first for our first Chad and right. movie hour? Like, what should they have watched? So we tried to when I put this together with you, we tried to. Um, get as rich of a, a universe of these two worlds, Alien Predator, mainly Alien, but we, ch we tried to, so we're not doing Predators or The Predator. So first, it's gonna be Predator and Predator 2. Predator 2 is the first film in that franchise that links it to Alien, okay? So it's gonna be Predator, Predator 2, and then both the Alien vs. Predator films. And then we'll jump into the Alien side of the universe for six films from there. So, fast so watch Predator 2. Those will be the first two coming down the pike. Yeah, get you some Carl Weathers. Get you some Carl uh, Weathers. Get you some uh, Schwarzeneggers. Get, but more uh, so get you some Carl Weathers. Like, yes, just like fasten the seatbelt, get in there nice and tight, read what you gotta read because when we come Next, we're going to come correct, and we're going to have already unpacked Predator, yeah. Predator Two, Alien versus Predator, and Alien versus Predator Requiem. So yeah. we may, gonna... yeah, we may split that into two videos, but that's going to be your homework: is Predator, Predator Two, Alien versus Predator, and Alien versus Predator Requiem. Yep, and then two hours a week, every week for the next five years, we'll be unpacking the franchise. Just alien alone. <laughs> yeah, just that. alien alone, yeah. I mean, we're yeah. gonna do an hour alone on Lance Henriks. Yeah. And then we're, and we're gonna do, we have to do an yeah. hour alone on Newt. Yes, I mean, come on. And that has some cool alien memorabilia, so I'm gonna try to, to show that in each video we do. Like, I'll stage myself with some props and things that I have. So that should be interesting. We and love fun. love a tight production value. <laughs> so I'm so excited. I cannot wait. I'm living for it. 
Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now. Well, no, I'm not gonna stop now. I'm gonna edit this out. I'm going to say my outro, and I'll let Chad uh, say his. I'll let you say yours. Um, but I just want to say and invite you guys. It will be linked in the description box. Please go to chadcivic.com. Get yourself some music. Check out Chad's amazing catalog of music, and uh, support. Uh, you know, if you're in Florida, if you're one of my Florida people, support a local artist. If not, just get yourself some amazing music. Um, and yeah, get the fuck on board with chadcivic.com. Chad, I want to say thank you again for just like allowing me space to like literally talk about shit I care about. Because I don't have a lot of space and or people that have seen the movies I've seen or like talk about the shit that I'm into to this degree and it really like feeds my soul. So like, thank you. Um, but yes, I can't wait to see our 50 hour director's cut of the alien situation. Yes, um, I feel the same way. I enjoy doing these with you so much.